Good day, everyone. Welcome to the WBCA NABC Coaches Forum. I am Corey Close, the head women's basketball coach at UCLA and vice president, uh, president-elect, crazy people that they let me do this, of the uh, Women's Basketball Coaches Association. And joining me today um, are some amazing coaches, and I'm excited to learn from them. I hope you will be too. But first up, uh, Georgia Tech head coach, uh, Nell Fortner. And also Loyola, Maryland, head men's basketball coach, Tavares Hardy. Auburn, head women's basketball coach, Johnny Harris. And Fresno State, head men's basketball coach, Justin Hudson. Welcome everybody. Hopefully we have everyone here. Justin, we got you there. I don't wanna lose you now. There it is. All right. Well, our topic today is gender equity in college basketball. It's been almost three months since social media posts by players and coaches participating in the NCAA Division I Women's and Men's Basketball Championships in San Antonio and Indianapolis, respectively, led to public outrage over the inequities in conditions experienced by women's and men's teams playing in the two championships and larger scrutiny of how NCAA governs, staffs, and administers women's and men's basketball in general. In July, the, the law firm of Kaplan, Hecker, and Fink, which was retained by the NCAA to conduct an external equity uh, review of all championships, will issue its first report, and that will focus on basketball. Gender equity discussions are nothing new. They've been ongoing since Title IX was signed into law 49 years ago uh, next week. And, you know, so this is not a new conversation, but it is, I would say it's definitely a heightened one. And I'm really excited to learn from our panelists. And let me just say this, um, and, and the panelists and I were talking before we started this webinar, that one of the things I wanna make really, really clear is women's basketball is excited about growing men's basketball. We are not looking to take anything away. I personally am a huge fan. I love uh, following it, learning from it, supporting it. Um, and so this quest for gender equity, uh, at least from a women's basketball perspective is clearly to really take away the boulders that inhibit our own growth. We actually wanna become an asset. We wanna become another revenue stream to actually be a help in this. So just really wanna start out that the whole tone of this conversation is not taking away, but figuring out how we can foster and add to. And so uh, that's really how we wanna frame this conversation. So Johnny, we're gonna start with you. Um, why now? Uh, you coached Texas at the championship in uh, San Antonio this year, beat my team's butt, unfortunately. Um, but what is it about San Antonio that struck a nerve and sparked this firestorm? So I think the, the first thing was, was the weight room issue. But for a lot of it, I, I believe it was, you know, after that, it, it was a, a more than that. It was more about, you know, about the women being treated as a, at a lower level, um, right? So, you know, not just the money, um, but the attitude, the attitude of maybe that, you know, the women didn't need it, or maybe that, um, you know, we wouldn't find out the differences between, um, it, you know, I, I think it was, you know, with the weight room, we had nothing. And then, you know, you see on social media where they had all these great facilities. Um, their floors were all new. We were all sent to, well, we weren't all, but, you know, some of us were sent to older gyms. Um, so just all those differences, you know, uh, the men having the PCR test, the women having the antigen, and you only get the PCR um, if you, you fail the antigen. So like all of these um, disparities, I, I feel like um, contributed to the frustration we felt. Um, but I think um, for me, it was about with all of these, with all of this, how do you, you know, we're preparing to, to play games. So even though you want to, you know, you, you want to address this and you have to address it, um, you, you still have to keep your kids focused, especially when you have a very inexperienced team. Um, you have to keep that. So I just think all of that 
coming together is what led to most of the, the frustration for the coaches in San Antonio. Yeah, really hard to have yeah. that balance of, you know, addressing it, but then not giving it too much weight to become a distraction, right? Yeah, yeah I can totally see that. Now, like Johnny, your team competed in this year's championship in San Antonio. You've also been a part of these discussions through the years. Um, you're as a coach, a broadcaster, and even as a coach of Team USA, which won the gold medal, by the way, in the 2000 Olympic Games. But briefly describe what you saw in San Antonio and tell us why 49 years after signing Title IX, you believe we're, why are we still having these conversations? Yeah, it, that's crazy that, that we are just at the level we're at after 49 years. You know, Corey, I, I think uh, you go back to the beginning of Title IX, and I think when it came into play, right off the bat, the bar was set very low for women coming out of Title IX because athletic directors didn't want to give us a whole lot, even though the law was saying you this was supposed to be equal. But look, we were coming from nothing. So just giving us uniforms and practice gear and letting us ride in a van instead of station wagons to a game, we thought we were rich. You know, this is great. But that was the bar that was set at the beginning because we came from nothing. So as the years went, you know, we're, we're you know, our, our sport is growing. Now kids are coming, uh, we're recruiting kids that are playing sports from the time they're, you know, five years old. So they're experiencing things different. Their, expect, their expectations are higher. But we get, you know, 49 years later, we're still, our bar is still systematically set way too low. But yet we have to take what, what we're given. And you're hearing, we, we've had voices, Donna Lopiano, Christine Grant from Iowa, that fight and push for gender equity with Title IX, but we just can't, you know, it's just a heavy, steep hill to climb still today. But I'm gonna tell you something, we're dealing with a generation now that we saw raise its head and voice in San Antonio because the perfect storm came together. Mm -hmm. Men at one site, women at one site, everything is noticeable. They're sharing photos, they're sharing information, and it's immediate information. And here we are today now talking about it, maybe on a platform and in a way that it's never been talked about at this level. Mm -hmm. Change is coming because this generation and information sharing is at, is at a level that's going to force change, I believe, as yeah. we go. I think the like the curtain was just pulled back. You yes. know, the, the, uh, the weight room, the food, the testing, the branding differences. Yes. Those were uh, symptoms, right, of what you just talked about of a greater illness that uh, of discrepancy between the sports and and this generation that they're like bring the light on, let's shine that's it brighter. Right. And uh, and I think that's interesting. I think you hit on something really important though, um, Nell, is that you know it's such hard. I call it living in the healthy tension of being really grateful for how far we've come. Right. Yeah. I mean, we have come so far, and we stand on the shoulders of many of the people you mentioned that have really blazed a trail for us to be doing what we are doing and experiencing the growth we have. So there's a great sense of gratitude, but at the same time, having a relentless quest uh, for how far we still have to go. And I like that steep climb that we still need to yeah. uh, embark on as women. And so uh, really appreciate that. And our, our, our vision to be thankful, but go, hey, we wanna raise the bar. I mean, right. we got more work to do. That's where we really wanna sit. And let me shift here to Justin. So Justin, you have such a unique uh, perspective, um, you know, a very successful male basketball, men's basketball coach, obviously married to a really great women's basketball coach. Um, but, you know, was there any reaction or conversation among coaches on the men's side about what was transpiring nationally during the basketball championships? Do you think the topics make some coaches on the men's side uncomfortable or nervous? You know, I think it can. I mean, there's a possibility that it can be, you become nervous, but you're right. I have a different perspective of having a, a wife who coaches women's basketball at the collegiate level. And I also have a perspective of being a high school coach before. So, you know, it's not a lot of money being made there. So you're going to have the same gym times there. And it's not as many inequities, I wouldn't think, as it would be in high major division one basketball. 
have three daughters perspective there. All of them played basketball in a certain level. So I think, you know, maybe my conversations with my wife, you know, it's eye opening. You know, I think I have to be a listener first before a talker. I think there obviously there's all kind of different perspectives about fair and equal, you know, and trying to, you know, decipher through the difference and see what's going on. But, you know, although the women had to go through what they had to do this year at the tournament, it's going to end up being positive because it definitely, you know, like you said before, opens the curtain to let everybody know nobody can say that's right. Mm -hmm. There was it was it was blatant. So, you know, the women were saying, hey, we want it to be fair. We want it to be equal. And it deserves to be that way. But now it just opened up the eyes of all the men's coaches, especially, you know, to say, wow, nobody can make any sense that way. It's supposed to be amateurism, right? Uh, there are two tournaments that are both important. And to have the discrepancies in the weight room, which everybody saw and the young lady from Oregon put it on. And then you're talking about now that the testing when we're talking about health and I mean, you can go on and on. And although I hate that everybody had to go through that this year, I think it was eye opening, especially for the man. Yeah. What is uh, Tony Bennett is a good friend and he talks about a painful gift. I feel like it was a painful gift, you know, that uh, it really in the moment it was uncomfortable and hard and it was it forced some really raw conversations and is continuing to do so. But I think in the long term, in terms of where we're trying to go, it really it really was a gift in that on that front. Um, Tavares and Justin, and you mentioned this already, Justin, you both have two daughters and Justin, you've added uh, and, and a dynamic um, of being married to Stacy, which we've mentioned, the head women's basketball coach at San Diego State. Um, and just are your families following the coverage of this story? And why are we not seeing more fathers of girls and young women speaking out publicly about these inequities? What do you think about that? Well, me personally, no, you don't know, you know, I mean, you're traveling around AAU or you're going to a high school game, like you said before, you're not quite sure with the inequities that it's going to be in high major college basketball mm -hmm. when they're talking about the, the big dollar. But I do have a different perspective of, you know, comparing notes with my wife mm -hmm. to also talking with Jamie here, who's our, our head women's basketball coach and comparing notes to the different schools and also different programs, men's and women and how people interpret Title IX. San Diego State might interpret Title IX totally different than Fresno State. They're both state schools. So I've, able, I'm, I've been able in the last few years to have some really purposeful conversations. Mm -hmm. That's great. So Arcia, yeah. what about you? Yeah, thanks, Coach. Uh, similar to Justin, uh, my wife isn't a coach, but she was a former student athlete. Uh, and so we got a chance to go through this a little bit uh, at the same time from a student athlete perspective. And so, yes, we, we have these conversations. Uh, our two daughters are, are trying to find their way in this sport. They're young, eighth grade and, and third grade. And so they still have a ways away, uh, but we certainly talk to, to them about that. And also I talk to my team about this. Uh, so much is, is communication, it's, it's relationships. Um, you have to you know, seek those out to be able to have a true understanding of what other folks are going through. And you know, we, we try to take a, a realist approach. Obviously the, the national news is, is, is one thing and uh, with everyone having a voice or, or being able to, to put their story out, their message out with social media, uh, it became glaring, but, but, but there are things so much deeper. Uh, how do your players interact with, with the women across the hall? Uh, how, do, how do your assistant coaches and director of operations interact? Um, you know, that's where we really try to lock in and, and, and focus and make sure that, that we're communicating the right way. And, and you know, like, like you said, coach, to start off, we're all in this together. And, and the more we can help each other, the better everyone will be. And so those are the conversations that we have, you know, with our team. And then, yes, uh, my wife is certainly going to hold me to that when I get home. I like her already. So, <laughs> but I think, you know, one of the things that, you, uh, you know, talking about action plans, I think you're in what you just said, Tavares, is so important in terms of going across the hall, having intentional support. And, and when the men's teams, you know, show up at the women's games and vice versa, um, when they're, you know, sort of celebrating each other's victories, uh, you know, that goes a long way of, you know, just making teams feel valued on the, those fronts. The other thing is, talking to your local media. You know, people ask me all the time, well, what can we do? You know, look for opportunities to, um, you know, pub your women's counterparts and uh, women's coaches do the same, like, you know, really 
celebrating each other in your local media markets, I think are, are really practical ways. You have to be intentional about it and you got to just look for opportunities with that and paying attention. But those are things that I think really do break down barriers and help each other grow. Um, I think it's, it sends a strong message on campus as well. I'll direct this to all of you. Uh, and this sort of goes to sort of your, uh, the conversations that you talked about, Tavares, going across the hall. But have you, have you all spoken to your, um, your male counterparts or your female counterparts on your campus about gender equities, inequities in your sport? And what do they think? Have you shared ideas or collaborated in any ways with each other on this subject? For instance, Nell, you've spoken, have you spoken with Josh and, and how does that work? Johnny, I know you just arrived at Auburn, but have you had a chance to talk to Bruce about this subject or, and, you know, obviously Tavares and uh, you, you have spoken about that already. And, um, and just, you know, you have a coach with, you know, Coach O'Ban there and she's going to be amazing up at Loyola, Maryland, but just what have the, what have those conversations been like? And maybe even at previous places you've worked with, um, but how have you done that practically and what's that been like? Yeah, I'll jump, jump in, yeah. Yeah, I'll jump in there. Um, you know, honestly, I I get along with Josh Pastner so well, our men's coach here at Georgia Tech, and their entire staff, from their strength coach to their trainer to their uh, all their assistants. I mean, we sit in on each other's practices. We share um, basketball ideas. But I'm going to be really honest with you. I, I've never had a conversation about gender inequities with Josh. That's just, that's me and him, because there's nothing, there's not anything for me to complain about at Georgia Tech. Um, and so I don't bring the, uh, everything else to the table to him about other things that we experience in, in the inequities. But I'm just, I know this, I'm so appreciative of my relationship with him and his staff, because it makes our jobs, both of our jobs, so much easier. Hey, I need to change practice one day. He's like, go for it, coach. Don't worry about it. We'll work around that. Or he needs to do it. No problem, Josh. You can have that time. We'll go over here. I mean, it's just that makes life so much easier. But I'm going to tell you this. It's the first time in my coaching career that's ever happened because I've worked with some coaches who we just didn't even have a relationship. And it felt like to me, the reason why is because we were a threat that we were trying to take something away or trying to get in the way. And that has never been the case. We all just wanna play ball. <laughs> we wanna play ball, we wanna win, we wanna get the best coaches and the best athletes into our program, period. And so that the inequity to me, I felt more in the past in my career and it, it feels much better now. Josh is um, younger and I think more forward thinking also. Before we move on to someone else, I just wanna, put you on the spot, Nell, about something I've heard you say about being an asset, you know, that you just feel like the, our world is missing out on the asset that women's basketball can be to a campus, to, uh, you know, a program. Can you talk a little bit about that? What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think women's basketball is an untapped gold mine. Are you kidding me? We've got athletes. This, our sport is growing at a pace that is very fast. We're bigger, we're taller, we're dunking now, we're doing things that, you know, that, that haven't been done, that they weren't done 15, 20 years ago. We're playing at a different pace now. Um, we're, we are, we can make money. I truly believe that we can be a revenue stream for our, for our campuses. But we, you said it, get the boulders out of our way. Help us do that. Give us what you give other other athletic teams, football, men's basketball, and, and let us work with that and move forward. And, uh, you know, so that's what I mean by that. We, we are an asset in the making. Just give us a little help, more help, Title IX help, you know, help us, help us get there and we will get there. I, I have no doubt. Well, I think that the new way of thinking in terms of engagement, branding through social media, raising sponsorship through the streaming side of things and yeah. being more getting out of just its ticket sales and TV revenue from the conferences, you know, that there's a lot more now with the changes of technology that where that asset can be tapped um, that really hasn't even been been uh, gone down that road. But going back to your campuses, I mean, talk about that, the rest of you, about your relationships, the conversations, what's going on on your campuses in, in regard to these issues? I'll follow um, Coach, Coach Nell, sorry. <laughs> um, 
just because I, I had the opportunity to work with Josh Pastner uh, for two years uh, at Georgia Tech. And so um, I know how he was. And as a young assistant coach that's working through the business, trying to find your way, uh, you are influenced by who you work for. And, and you know, I would say for me, I've had a chance to work for great bosses who, who value uh, uh, the, the equity in, in, on both sides. And so uh, at Georgetown, when I was leaving, they were building uh, the new facility and the exact same gym that the men got, the women got. Uh, and so, yes, there's challenges occasionally when you're sharing the same facility, but when you can have your own, uh, it, it, it makes it a lot better. And then, you know, my first uh, boss, Bill Carmody at Northwestern, uh, I mean, he was fantastic. I remember Coach Muffet from Notre Dame used to come by a lot uh, when I was a player and then when I was a coach. Uh, they just had a tremendous relationship in addition to his relationship uh, with our, 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 our women's coach at Northwestern. And, you know, just, just seeing that has sort of shaped uh, who I'm going to be as a head coach. Um, I, I tell my players all the time, you can't hide from history. And, and unfortunately, uh, the, the, the history of gender equality is not one that we like to would, would like to mirror uh, going forward. And so uh, how we're influenced by the people before us makes a difference. And so we have to do our job in today's day and age to make sure that we're doing what's right and influence the generation behind us to can continue to grow it and make this uh, area better. Yeah. Johnny, were you gonna go next? I was. Um, so like you said, I'm, you know, me and my staff are just getting here, but the thing coming in, um, it was clear to me that gender equality was important. It was important on a, our, our uh, campus. Um, and, and that's, you know, between all the sports, um, our AD, our SWA, they made sure that they were committed um, to making sure all of our student athletes were treated you know, fairly and had the same opportunities, the same resources. So with Bruce, he's been, he's been great. He's been amazing, very supportive. Um, he's over here. He, um, we've been able to work together. Uh, there's been absolutely no problem, and I, I, you know, fully expect that to continue. How about for you, Justin? Yes, we've had, me and Jamie have a great relationship here. You know, we've collaborated in recruiting. You know, I think we don't have separate gyms, so we have to really discuss gym times and when we're going to work together and, and when it's open. So you have to have a great relationship because it's, we have to work together here with, with a little less resources than somebody as a Georgetown who may say, okay, we're going to build this arena and build this arena. And, you know, we have to work on sharing, on getting in arenas, have ideas, and when we can get into our Save Mart Center a little bit more in the summer, you know, recruiting for football games and trying to piggyback so we can have it more like a party atmosphere and we can show love to, to their recruits as well as them showing them to ours. You know, I think it's very important that you have a great relationship with your staff. And I want to model that to my young men. When we talk about making change and Tavares talked about not being proud of our history. I think, you know, if I have 13... 13 young men on my team that I can help influence for the future to make sure that we do have a great relationship. I'm always showing respect, get off the floor when it's time to get off the floor, right? You know, share, you know, just very simple humanity things to make sure to know that they are equal. They are equal. They play just like they do. They lace them up. It's not, there's nobody's any more important than the others. And let's make sure we enjoy one another and help one another. That says so much about you, Justin, and just, uh, in both of you, Tavares, you were the same way. Uh, just appreciate um, people like that, that value women that are trying to master their craft in the same way and, and just says so much about your character. So really appreciate that. Um, well, let's let's talk about some of the, uh, the uncomfortable sides. Those are the feel good sides a little bit here, but uh, do in inequities exist and how, women, how do women's basketball, um, how are you treated on your own campuses? Or what have you noticed as some things we need to bring to light maybe on some other campuses or just what you've learned from some of your peers? I think, you know, how can we, what kind of institutional resources can be leveraged to collectively elevate both men's and women's basketball programs? And how can you support your colleagues more on the other side? Let's, let's talk a little bit about 
what maybe it's not at your school maybe we're all pretty lucky here you know but uh but what have you noticed what needs to continue to be talked about what are the things that continue to happen that we need to find solutions for and have hard conversations about and then how can we leverage resources together and support our colleagues on a more consistent basis and anyone can jump in on that yeah um i'll step i'll go i'll talk about something that i just found this out on uh, that um and it was surprising to me and i know i just said we don't i really we don't really have any problems here but i'm about to tell you one so maybe this one and i think it's just um it's a simple fix but i was surprised when i heard about it you know we on campus you get these you you have a, a blast email list of maybe every student on campus so some of y'all might have 50,000 students some have 20,000 10,000 or whatever that is but that you can send out a message hey football's playing uh duke this weekend and uh blah 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 well they I found out they send out about three or four of those a week prior to the football game you know trying to get the students to the game well then I find out they're sending them out for men's basketball about three times a week prior to the where's well I'm like well what about women's basketball we sit in a corner at the end bottom of one of those emails about I was so upset when I heard that because why wouldn't you just do the same thing for the women's basketball game I, I don't understand that didn't even make any sense to me I couldn't even hardly process it well trust me we fixed that <laughs> so <laughs> we got that fixed um but it's those it's those little things and that that's the kind of thing that harkens back to back in the day where women were thought of in you know an afterthought you know and maybe we'll give them a little something or whatever and if we got anything we were happy about it but i'm not happy we're not happy about a little bit of thought anymore so that's a that's an example of just a small thing on a campus that that can get that can happen to a women's team whether you're basketball swimming tennis or whatever but that can be fixed so easily but that's a mind adjustment to the people working in that marketing office, you know, um, with whoever the boss is sending out the message to to the workers. So anyway, we well, got just, that one fixed. Just a small build on that is that, you know, if a men's coach, if you guys have a chance to meet with your marketing people and they're giving you some marketing plans for the year, if you were just to say, hey, are there any opportunities to work together with the women? Any way we can combine marketing efforts just for you to initiate some of those conversations with your marketing staffs, or if you're out doing speaking engagements, hey, is this an opportunity I could bring, you know, the women's coach along? And you know, those those things go a long way, um, and, and I actually think they help your image and your the men's image and the men's programs grow as well. So those are just building on that. Those those small things go a long way. Let, let me just jump on that, Corey, yeah. real quick because that's a great example. Cause Josh, um, when I got here, he invited me to several things so he could introduce me to his, whether they were fans, donors or whatever. And I'm, I'll always be so ingratiated to him for that opportunity because he didn't have to do that, but that is one of the things you're talking about. Absolutely. Just, um, mm -hmm. Give us a helping hand a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about the rest of y'all? Anyone jump in? Any inequities that you guys have seen or anything that needs to continue to be talked about? Uh, just from our perspective, um, I would say, you know, I'm sure there's coaches on this call from all different levels. Uh, I've had a chance to coach, as I've mentioned, some of the other schools at the Power Five level, but, you know, now we're in the Patriot League. And, and so the gap, um, just in terms of perceived revenue, uh, you know, none of us have big television contracts or anything like that or selling out 30,000 seat arenas. And so, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, known inequities between our sports at this level. Um, you know, I, I had a chance to come in uh, under under Coach Joe Logan, uh, who is the women's coach, the counterpart, and, and he, you know, laid it out for me. Uh, just we're, we're partners. It was awesome. And, and now I get a chance to reciprocate and do that for Coach Danny O'Bannon, who, who just started um, and, and just make sure that we keep the same uh, sort of helpful mentality, you know, we're, we're in this together. And so from our side, you know, we're, we're trying to partner as much as we can. You know, I always say, you know, 
I actually had a conversation with my AD uh, this morning, Donna Woodruff, and I, I told her I would bring it up, but uh, because it's so relevant and, and I'm a real person, I'm going to tell you guys, <laughs> uh, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, just a, a, a something, you know, you guys know at our level, you have to do guarantee games and, and, and kind of help with the budget from time to time. And, and, and so we're talking about, um, you know, is there a way to take an extra guarantee game to, to, to help out both programs? Um, it's never just about, uh, for men's basketball. It's always with the thought that can we do a little bit more to help everyone? Because that's, that's what we're all about. We're all in this together. And, um, you know, I know that the women's coaches feel the same way. The better we do, the better uh, everyone does and the better they do. It's the same thing. And so that's, that's why we try to work together. And, and, you know, we haven't had at this level any, any bumps in the roads in that regard. Justin, were you going to say something before that? Uh, you know, I think everybody, Title IX, you know, inequities, you know, very simple in that fashion. It, it needs to be fair and equal. I think when you st really start getting tested is when your school doesn't have as many resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think everybody can talk about it. I think it's easy if we're both sharing a practice facility and it's just us two and we can put a curtain down or you have yours and I have mine. I think when you start taking out, taking stuff out of people's pocket or people got to go raise money and you got to raise it for both people, then that's when you're really going to be tested to see what's going on and do you really believe in gender equity mm -hmm. and are you really going to support it? So you know, everybody has been a lot of different schools and, and the interpretations have been different at a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, and not, not to get in any specifics, I would just think when, when you don't have as many resources and you're raising money and you're trying to keep up with the Joneses and you're, you know, and you're trying to practice all in the same facility and you're sharing it with volleyball or you're sharing it with women's basketball. And now when you're talking about your relationship with your women's program has to be great and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Johnny, do you have anything to add there? Well, I haven't experienced the inequalities, but I have um, been fortunate, uh, blessed enough to have worked with two, you know, with Coach Blair and Big Schaefer, very strong, um, you know, men that goes out and fight, um, you know, fight for, for what they need. And so um, I was taught uh, different ways to go out and get that or fight for it, um, just so that our student athletes wouldn't feel like they were, um, we're being treated differently. Mm -hmm. So it may not come from one source, but you have to go and find a different way of getting it. So, um, you know, that's just what I would like to add to that. Yeah. Well, and I think that's one of the ways that we can really build for each other, right? And celebrate that. If we come from places that um, are, we've had the privilege of being treated really well and working for really strong people. That's really an important uh, dynamic to be able to celebrate. And so, and that sort of leads me into uh, this Kaplan report, right? Okay, so, and I've actually had the opportunity to meet with Kaplan several times. I believe they're doing an excellent job. Uh, and I'll be honest, I was a little bit apprehensive uh, when the NCA hired them, how are they going to be objective? What's going to really happen from this? You know, how are they, but to their credit, they've been professional and invested and really want to do what's right. Um, so as that report comes out, um, you know, we'll, the report will be submitted to the NCA, to the Board of Governors next month, and will hopefully be released publicly shortly after. What are your hopes for and concerns about maybe uh, with this report coming back? Or what are your expectations? Uh, and I'll, I'm going to start with um, Nell, you and Johnny on this, um, but, and then I'll, I would follow up with, with the guys about, you know, how can you help uh, with this report comes out and how can you be a supporter of like, we're excited to, to figure out how we can address these issues, but, you know, what are your expectations Nell to, about what, what this is, what to do once the Kaplan report comes out? Well, I, I think my expectation is, um, is that we that they identify what you've you've called today the roadblocks where are the roadblocks and how do we get them down how do we get them out of the way so we can move forward um and some of those roadblocks were you know you know like the 20 years ago whenever the ncaa signed the cbs tv contract well that was a lot of money coming in billions of dollars well 
if you're going to pay billions of dollars for something, you're going to give up some, <laughs> there's going to be some kind of rights given up. And I, I, I think it feels like some of those rights hindered our growth. So whatever that contract did that helped the men, it hurt the women as far as growing our part of an NCAA championship sport. Um, and that's, and I hope that we see what that is and can we get that out of the way? And now can our championship grow faster, stronger, bigger now that those boulders are out of the way? Mm -hmm. um, whether that is the beautiful courts, you know, when you're flipping through the TV, you know, during the NCAA tournament, man, y'all, the hey, Justin and Tavares, y'all's tournament was popping you know the the courts were a ncaa final four march madden i mean it was popping and when you flip through to look for a women's game you might have thought you were coming upon a high school state championship because it was on a floor that said nothing about the ncaa championship I, that still blows my mind today i hope we find out some answers for that one why why does our tournament look so different on tv than it does for the men's when it comes to using final four, when it comes to using March madness, when it, you know, things like that. So my, my, my hope is that we find those boulders and, and get them out of the way so we can grow. And I, I think we'll grow fast. And so you're saying specifically now, if I hear you correctly, that, you know, the issues of corporate sponsorship, how to infuse yes. people that would want to get involved in our game, but the contractual exclusivity prohibits that from happening on the women's side to its nth degree. And then from a branding perspective, you know, Kelly Graves had a great comparison. Kelly Graves, the head women's basketball coach at Oregon, he participated in the women's tournament, but his son uh, played for Gonzaga men's tournament. So after his team was eliminated from the women's tournament, he went to Indianapolis and was just blown away. You walked through that city and everybody knew that it was, it was March Madness time. The men's tournament was happening. He said, if I walk through San Antonio, it was a completely different feel. And, you know, I wonder if, let's say, you know, uh, Justin, your players were in the NCAA tournament and they were in San Antonio. How would they feel about their experience if, unless, if they were in Indianapolis and a certain thing, just as an example, but if I hear you correctly on that. Um, but Johnny, go ahead. I interrupted. So, uh, you know, what, what, are, what are your hopes for this Kaplan report? <clears throat> so, um, actually, I agree with Nell, um, you know, that we need to continue to uh, have these critical conversations and that they will lead us to solutions um, that, that would help solve the problems of, you know, of why we're having these issues, you know, that, um, you know, so that our, our women, uh, you know, Nell said it earlier, uh, we have young ladies that are dunking, they're bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. Well, that's because before we didn't have uh, access to the strength coaches, the, the weight room. But once you give us that, we're different. We are relevant. So, I, you know, if you continue to open up those avenues for us, the same that you open up for men, you'll see the women game continue to grow. Great thoughts. Thank you, guys. Um, you know, and, and just a sort of a side note, too, is Justin and, um, and, and Tavares, do you guys, you know, do you guys know about the Kaplan report? Is that something that's talked about on the men's side? Um, you know, for the women, it's like every day right now, right? So, um, but is that, is that realistic? I mean, do you guys even have an expectation of what, what's going on with that? No, I didn't. I didn't know about the Kaplan report. Now, if you were going to pose the question to me, I think my my responsibility in it is to know about it. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. to read it, to to find out when it's coming out, to talk to Stacy about it, to talk to Jamie about it, and then now educate our student athletes on it, and make sure they're understanding because that's a big part of it. I've said it before, but I do agree with that. I try to stay in house on this way. I'm not a big social media guy. I will get on it time to time if there's something that you think is important, but it's not my voice. But I, have, I do have a great voice with my 13 student athletes mm -hmm. so I can help them to understand. So for the future that we can change things through those guys, because that's what's happening now is like you mentioned it before, our generation is not taking it. So yeah. I can be a great role model for them. So I'm going to start with make sure I read the Kaplan report and talk to Jamie and Stacy about it. So now I can be a huge advocate and go from there. 
Well, let me give you one other resource, uh, ourfairshot.com. Uh, it was formed uh, at, um, as a result of what the curtain being pulled back in the NCAA tournament. And there is pretty much, and there's several direct side-by-side -side comparisons. If you were to do a, a 10 minute overview for your young men under your supervision, that would be a great place to start. And just to say, hey, these, this is why they're doing this report. These are the, some of the things that came to light. And, you know, maybe even encouraging them to follow Our Fair Shot on social media and having your men's players retweet it if they're involved in that. I mean, that, that would be powerful, you know, for, for you to, to, to educate them about why is this even happening? Uh, you know, what, what things came to light? And it's very clear on that website. And there's even articles uh, and videos about things that have happened from that. Uh, that would be really cool, um, you know, Justin, and just really appreciate your humility and willingness to say, hey, I, I got to be educated on that. What are your thoughts, Tavares? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I promised my wife that, you know, I would make sure I at least represented the other perspective um, and the other side of things uh, in, in the right way. Uh, at least once or twice. I told her that. I said, I have to make sure that that, that we get the other side uh, across. Otherwise, why am I here? Uh, Absolutely. And, and so I, I like how you started in terms of um, talking about how uh, it is not the goal of the women's coaches uh, to take away from the men, because a lot of times that's what a lot of people think. Um, yeah. and, and so I like the analogy. I, I was on the uh, hiring committee for our new chief equity and inclusion officer, and I saw like a lot of equity and inclusion things that I hadn't really been exposed to. So I'm sure some of you have seen that, 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 that graph, that picture uh, where, you know, three people are at a baseball game and the tallest person can see over the fence. Uh, the next tallest person can't, so they need a small box. And then the, the shortest person of the group really can. And so they need a bigger box. And, and talking about how equity doesn't mean equal. The tallest person doesn't need a box because he can see over the fence. Well, I would like to look at it from a different perspective for a quick second. What if that tallest person doesn't want to watch the game? <laughs> uh, what if they would prefer to have a bat and practice the game? And so the, the, the shortest person gets the bigger box and they want to watch the game. Does that mean they also get the bat even though they don't care about playing it? And so just making sure that whatever the needs are, that's what we attack. And, and it's not always going to be equal uh, is going to make sure that that people's needs are met. Our student athletes across both sides are getting the best experience they can possibly get. Understanding that we don't all have the same resources. I remember uh, if I had to say, you know, uh, Nell, my time at Georgia Tech, you know, the women's team fly charters. We don't fly charter here at Loyola on the men's side. And so, do we? Our student athletes, our student athletes, just like the women at Georgia Tech. Do we get a fair shake? You know what I'm saying? So like, understand, we don't think like that, of course, uh, but, but, but there's gonna be differences. Not everything is gonna be equal, but it should be equitable and it should be fair. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, Tavares has given me a little courage to talk on that, you know, and Go that for part, it. you know, it's me and Jamie and actually I, we had an assistant coach in here yesterday. I was talking to her about this and, you know, in, in the, in the journey to become equal and fair, you know, again, we should be able to communicate what our needs are. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, if I, if I feel like my guys need, you know, extra shirts and Jamie wants extra shoes, well, you know, that's to me, that's equal. Mm -hmm. That's fair. I mean, what do we need? There needs to be more discussions. You know, yeah. I think there's, I think, I do think there's some overcorrections or some, some laziness involved in it. And I think it has to do with resources. We mentioned that before, if we're both sharing a $20 million practice facility or, or we're actually building them and you got one side by side, it's a little easier. It's a little tougher when you're at a place like Loyola Fresno State, when you actually got to have conversations about what's it going to be important for you to win, Jamie, and what's is important for you to win, Justin, and now let's work from there to be equal. Let's start off there mm -hmm. instead of buying me, to use Tavares's example, you know, buying me four stools and I don't really need stools. I need bats and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Well said. And I think that's honestly, that's where we need to have the most conversations because perception becomes reality, right? And if we don't have the courage to go like, okay, what is the difference between equity and equality? What's the difference? What's 
fair? What, what promotes growth on the women's side, which maybe is different than the men's side, you know? And I just think that's so wise because um, if, if we are always seen at the women's side as, well, we're just trying to get a handout or, you know, we're not trying to, we're trying to move from being seen as a charity or a cause to a product and an asset that we talked about earlier. And so, and if we don't ever talk about those differences, those hard conversations, we're just going to be perceived as these, you know, angry, frustrated women trying to get more, you know, and, and I don't agree with that, but perception becomes reality if we're not willing to embark on those hard conversations and build some of those bridges. Were you going to follow up on that now? I was just going to say from what you were saying, um, I think that's the, what you just said, I think that was the mindset from the very beginning of Title IX. I think that athletic directors were maybe angry that they were going to have to share money with women because why should, why would they want to share their money? Why would they want to give their money to women when they didn't think that the women were going to be able to give anything back from it? But you, we will, if you just open, <laughs> open a pathway for us. I mean, we work hard, we work extremely hard. And as after 49 years, you see how we've grown to this point. We're not trying to take anything away from anybody. We just want our fair shot. And that's, that's the attitude that has to change along with what we're doing right now. It's, it's a, there's an attitude that has to change. And I think it's coming because we have a younger generation coming up the pipe like Tavares and Justin and coming up to, to educate and help us move forward. Yeah, well said. Anybody else on on that uh, on that front? And I love that, you know, Tavares and Justin, bring those things coming, you know, keep them coming because yeah. you represent a group that uh, there's got to be understanding. And I think we need to hear consistently from the other side, you know, and so that there becomes a situation where there actually becomes not another side because we're, we become symbiotic and there's understanding and we know how to foster each other's growth. So thank you for that. You know, really big, you know, thing I think that is going to change the game for all of us, male and female, is NIL. Uh, it seems to be um, the issue currently consuming the oxygen in all of college athletics to the extent that the NCAA is really asking uh, Congress to intervene. It, it is also time for Congress to become involved in resolving the systematic challenges of gender equity in our sport as well. Um, but, you know, how do you see... Um, the NIL, I, I, it's sort of going off script, but I think this is really an interesting opportunity specifically for women. Uh, you know, they did that study, they took the, the uh, from a branding perspective, just a financial institution, if you were analyzing the tops, the Sweet 16 men's teams and the Sweet 16 women's teams, only based on branding potential from a corporate perspective through influencers and social media, eight out of 10 of the top people from that financial perspective of analyzing all those rosters were women. Um, their storytellers are great opportunity. So that doesn't take anything away from anybody, but teaching our women how to maximize their ability to be attractive from a brand sponsorship. They have 80% of the buying power in our society in consumer buying. And that's just a corporate view, right? Um, but how do you see NIL affecting some of this and how are you embarking on that in your own programs? Oof. I know that's a big one. It's sort of off script a little bit too, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll just hit it and, and get out of it because I, 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 I don't even think any of us know exactly how this is all gonna play out because it's so different than what we've, been able to, you know, for our student athletes to do. I think it's going to have to just get here and let's see what happens. But I think social media is going to be such a huge part of it for where athletes are going to be able to monetize their brand and themselves. Um, I think the, the jury is out on how this, the NIL plays out with donors and recruiting. And I, I hate to even go down that road and think about that. Uh, you know, if our if our kids can can do some things and monetize some things on their TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and 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 gain some traction there and then great. I, I don't, but I don't really, honestly, Corey. I don't know how this thing plays out. I'm just waiting to see how it what happens in the first you know six months and and what it feels like. But we're set up here at Georgia Tech to help our athletes um, navigate it. 
and and um, understand it and understand how to build their brand and things like that. But I don't know how this thing's going to play out. I, and I'm interested to see who knows. Absolutely. I, I, yeah. Does anyone have anything else on that front? And then I'm going to go to a question that somebody wrote in um, sort of regarding that issue. Does anyone else have on anything on that part? I'll speak to, to NIL just real quickly. Um, you know, I'm a little nervous about it uh, across the board. Again, having seen it from a bunch of different perspectives throughout the country, different places I've worked, um, you know, from a women's perspective and, and even, even men, I, I think some of the folks that they're projecting out to be the highest earners, it, it's not about their ability, it's about their looks, um, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, however you want to look at it. Um, but I, I think, you know, I was talking to a, a men's coach who we were just discussing a lot of these things. And, you know, he's talking about how one of his former players who had a solid career, not great, but he has, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of Instagram followers because he's, he's like a model. <laughs> uh, you know, women like the way he looks and he can promote products and things of, of that nature. And so I just want to make sure we're keeping things in perspective um, with, with what college athletics is supposed to be all about. The other piece I'll, I'll quickly speak to, I'm very passionate about you know, I, I worry that the, the conversation is uh, too easily being allowed to shift away from education. And I think it's gonna disproportionately affect our black and brown student athletes from underprivileged environments. And, and so they're dangling the carrots out in front of their faces saying that you can get paid while you're in school, uh, but between NIL and the transfer portal being what it is, how many of them are really getting an, an education and value in an education? Uh, and, and graduation rates are going to slip and uh, attention to detail in the classroom is going to be uh, uh, less because people want to get paid. And, and I just think that that's going to hurt uh, underprivileged kids in the long run. And so, you know, I, I'm, I know you got to do it. I know the, the arguments. I know, you know, folks want to shout out coaches salaries and things of that nature. But uh, I, I'm a little worried, to be honest. Yeah. I think I think I am I am too. Um, but I also was like, okay, it's coming, right? And so, how do we um, put ourselves in a position to? Because the question I think is really good one from from uh, Crystal that with the emergence of NIL, how do we make sure our young women aren't hypersexualized? Which you're just talking about the other side of what you just said, you know, Tavares, um, and to be able to brand themselves outside of just their appearances. And I think the, the way in which we have to, at least the way I've, I'm attempting to do that is, what do you want your brand to be about to our young people? Like, this is not just about making a dollar. Like, how do you wanna use your brand to make a difference in the world? You know, what, what are the characteristics and try to, it's sort of like when uh, cell phones were just, it, you know, they were, they were first coming and we were like, all they ever do is be on their phones. Well, we had to adjust, right? And we had to figure out they're here, like it or not, we got to adjust and do that and equip them. But I agree, I, I share some of your same fears, but I think that the way to do that is to educate as best we can of how do we use this in the positive. I mean, I had the same fears also about, let's say you're in your locker rooms, male or female, doesn't matter, and you got one person making all this money, that's really going to be a small percentage. But how do you keep amateurism and education at the prim you know, primary value, have a cohesive, selfless, hardworking um, it, locker room environment culture within your program with all of these other temptations and distractions surrounding. And, and I think that goes across gender lines, right? And, uh, but that's something I'm worried about too. Um, I think the, the way it applies with the gender equity though, is I do think it's one of the first things that are coming that um, the highest advantage actually is the potential is for, for women. When you look at the studies and how that's happening, that's, you know, for them to be able to learn how to leverage that in a respectful, education-minded, well-structured way, there is opportunity there for women that that's a way that we can just grow and we're not taking anything from anybody, right? Mm -hmm. So, well, I want to, um, you know, there's another question. So why, well, let me ask, answer this question before we only have a few minutes before we close up. Why is athletic patriarchy so powerful and how has it been so successful in keeping women marginalized in athletics? Whew, that's swimming in the deep end. She, um, I like it, but anyone have any thoughts on that? Why is athletic patriarchy so powerful and how has it been so successful in keeping women marginalized within athletics? 
Uh, somebody else is going to have to answer that question. I don't have a ladder deep enough to get out of the deep end. Of the I don't think any of my players are watching this, but if they were, they, they'd roll their eyes at, at what I'm about to say. I was watching <laughs> one of my favorite movies, Lincoln, uh, about Abraham Lincoln, and, and I make them watch it sometimes. And so they that's why they would roll their eyes. But there was a scene in the movie where, uh, you know, one of the congressmen was speaking about the 13th Amendment, and, and, and he said, look, I hate slavery, but if we abolish slavery, think about what comes with that. And, and basically, he's trying to say, now we're going to have to let Black men vote. Um, and, and everybody like went up in arms. And then he said, what comes after that? Are, are we going to let women vote? And then everybody just flipped out. And, and so I'm saying all that to say, you know, that's history. Um, and, and that's what this society ha has, has grown up from. And, and so much of the civil rights movements and the, and the, and the women's movement um, has mirrored each other throughout the years. And, and, and we're fighting that. You know, I, those, those folks uh, in some ways were our grandparents' grandparents. So it's, it's not that far removed from, from where we are today. Um, and, and so that's something that, is, is, as we've talked about across the board, we got to continue to, to fight. Everyone's talked about how we got 13 student athletes that we got to continue to change. And uh, hopefully eventually that, that trickles down through that and uh, continues to grow and continues to get better. But I still, I come back to, you can't, you can't hide from history. And that's to answer the question, that's why this, this, this system is set up the way it's set up. Well said, I appreciate you uh, jumping in on that. That's, uh, I'm just gonna ask one more question and then I'm gonna give you a, a, an opportunity to go around the horn with some final thoughts. But th this last question is just for Tavares and Justin. And again, the, the WBCA is never gonna have me do this again because I'm going off script. But you brought up something I think is really important and I think we need your wisdom is, what if you would follow the sentence? Um, I just wish the women coaches understood blank. What would you want us to understand? What would you want us to really hear from you as we we try to grow our sport and do it in a really uh, a spirit of gratitude, but also one that's relentlessly trying to move it forward? What would you want us to understand? What would you want? Maybe where is a blind spot that maybe you could shed some light that we might need to hear? And also touch you in there, you know, I don't know, wisdom, saying I have wisdom, I think you're overstretching there, but yeah. I might have an opinion, you, you know, it. and it's just an opinion, because what I'm about it, I just think we need to have better communication. I think the more communication to speak about it, because, you know, you're talking about people telling you no, right? So I'm getting honest, like women are being told no, being told no. Well, in my experience here, I'm the only one being told no. Mm. Mm. so it doesn't that doesn't that yeah. doesn't fly here at fresno state so maybe that was your experience there or maybe your experience here but i just think that evolves with more conversation that's not her fault my fault anybody's fault it's just let's communicate about it mm -hmm. you know and and now you can get into the weeds to say what's fair what's equal and now we're working together instead of because right now i'm the one being told no mm. great point thanks for sharing that justin Tavares, how about from you? What would you want us, what the women's uh, side a little bit, I hate to use that word side, but what would you want us to understand that maybe we don't? I would say that the vast majority of us do care. Mm -hmm. um, as much as we put so much time and effort and energy into building our programs and, and trying to provide the best student athlete experience for our men, uh, we also care about the student athlete experience of our women counterparts. Um, and although we'll fight for our program, and sometimes that fight may sound a little uh, aggressive or, um, you know, unfair in certain ways, you know, a lot of men on our side do look at it as we do have a unique opportunity to help everyone if we're successful, um, and as does football and things of that nature. And so even though we may uh, fight a little harder to, to make sure we're able to do that, a lot of men are thinking about, um, you know, it's not just about us, it's about the whole. Well said. Final thoughts before we close up from, you know, just in this area of, of gender equity, final thoughts uh, from each, all four of you, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I'll finish it. Well, I'll go first. Um, I'm very hopeful. Mm. I'm, I'm hopeful that, and I'm, I'm optimistic that we are going to move out of this. 
I'm optimistic, especially as I hear Tavares and Justin speak today, because um, we're hearing two men that are um, forward thinking, that are coaching young men and, and sending them out into the world. And I know they're going to send them out in the right way as far as and they're thinking about women's athletics. And if they happen to turn into coaches or strength coaches or whatever, that they have had two good role models. I'm hopeful and, and optimistic that there are a lot more men out there in collegiate athletics that are gonna be thinking the same way and, and sending their young men out into the world um, on a positive note when you think about women's athletics. I just think we're changing. This generate, this younger generation is coming up the pipe and, and wanting things to be done right and fair and equal. Yeah, they're not always equal, but they're fair. And I feel hopeful for that. I agree with that. And one of the ways I feel like, you know, we achieve that is by continued, continuing to have these conversations because, you know, I found that there are a lot of people and I'm not gonna say that they don't know, but they don't think about it. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of these things weren't, weren't thought of as a problem until we had the situation in San Antonio. So we have to continue to have these conversations and come up with solutions. And, you know, we're trying to empower our student athletes to, you know, use their voices when they're in their SAC meetings, when they have a concern to talk to their administrators, our administrators to, you know, our AD about these concerns because that is welcomed on this campus. And, you know, when they, when you talk about it, you know, you'll be able to come up with a solution, but I also agree that we are moving forward. Mm -hmm. Tavares, Justin? Communication is the key. You know, I've been fortunate enough to, to watch my wife work as hard as I do. You know, her, her student athletes, work as hard as mine do, you know, and these, what happened in San Antonio was, was unacceptable and it pulled back the curtain and now it opens up the door to more communication, you know, where we can work together and be educated about one another's issues and what we have to do. Coaches are problem solvers by nature, that's what we do. So let's get into a room and communicate about that, whether it starts with on your campus and your institution and then it goes further nationally. Amen. I'll just piggyback off of that because I think the communication will also lead to building authentic relationships. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's, that's huge for our business. We have to support each other and it's hard to do it if it's fake. Like we can go out there and take a picture at the, at the game and, and post it on Instagram, but are we really having those hard conversations? Do we have real relationships? Are we watching each other? I tell my wife all the time, I wanna see my daughter watching women's college basketball. I wanna see her watching WNBA basketball. And you know what? I want my sons to do it too, <laughs> uh, because that's that's what we got to get to a point where we're all enjoying that game and celebrating it and tweeting about it and showing up um, to, to really get it to where it's capable of going. And I know it, it, it is capable of getting there and, and through authentic relationships that'll help us uh, move forward in that process. You four have blessed me today. Uh, thank you. Uh, to Nell and Johnny, Tavares, Justin, uh, just thank you for joining us. Thank you for your authenticity, for your wisdom, for your courage, uh, for your hope. Um, thank you to the WBCA and NABC Coaches Forum to have this discussion. Uh, we're really regret grateful for that relationship. Uh, for more information on our two associations, to watch a recording of today's forum, visit wbca.org and nabc.com. And for more information specifically on the inequities that exist in college basketball, please visit OurFairShot.com, the WBCA's new website dedicated to this initiative. Um, you know, I'll just, I will just leave us with this part on, from my personal thoughts are, I am also hopeful. I like what Nell said. And I, I, wanna, I wanna close the way we started to say, um, bottom line is we wanna foster growth together. And at the same time, we also are like, you know what, this is unacceptable. And we've had several um, white papers and other people that have done a lot of good work that have sat on shelves. And we are gonna need everybody. We're gonna need the Tavares's of the world and the Justins of the world who really get it to when this Kaplan report comes out saying, no, we are gonna continue the communication. We are gonna be problem solvers. We are gonna, this is not gonna sit on a shelf. 
this is our time to be solution minded and really care about each other together. And so that is my real hope for us is that we, our passion would not wane and this report would never be another paper, that it would be an action plan to uh, collaboratively move forward and to move the women's game forward and not at the expense of the men's game um, at a, as, as an opportunity to foster impacting young people and giving men and women the, the equitable opportunity to master their craft and to be able to experience their maximum growth. So. Thank you all, I apologize for going a few minutes over, but thank you all for your time. Thank you to the WBCA, to the NABC, and I look forward to making great strides together.